Hello, I'm Malcolm Hazlitt. Is there an adventure before dementia? We'll find out from old Jack the Aussie Glee Man and what can we do to stave off some of the things that slow us down as we age? Oh, I think I'd better watch this program myself. It's our time. Great to have your company with us once again. I'm all alone because Janice is somewhere jetting off around the world. I don't know, somewhere in the Mediterranean, probably in Egypt by now, I suspect. But she'll be back soon. We also have on this program one of our favourite guests, Kimberly Douglas. But right now, I'd like to introduce to you John R. Sabine, who some people know as Old Jack, the Aussie Glee Man. Right, that's the stage persona. Right. But you're really not that. You're really... Well, it depends what you mean by really. Really. Because you've had more than one career, haven't you, in your yeah. lifetime? Well, I consider I'm now into my third career. OK. The let's... First, first up, um, in the general run of things, I was academic, scientist, gloried in the title of reader in animal physiology at the University Goodness. of Adelaide. Goodness me. What did that entail? Well, that's an interesting question because I, I know my ones. kids and my mother before them would always say to me, now, what do you do? Yes. And I'd explain it all, of course, in great detail, and then they'd say, but what actually do you do? <laughs> <laughs> so what so, do you do? <laughs> I did, what did you did? I yes. did. What I did do, you did, did, did science. I, in fact, established quite a reasonably uh, secure international reputation in several fields. Big issue was cholesterol. Mm -hmm. All you want to know about cholesterol? All you don't want to know about cholesterol? It's I'd true. I'd be happy to tell you at great length. Oh, I, well, could you make it short length? Does everybody have cholesterol? Well, we've all got it. You can't do without it. Critically important. And so I was always worried more about what happened if it got too low rather than, than if it too got high, too high. Because everybody talks about it being everybody too high. Everybody talks about it being too high. OK, so in this part of your career, you kept lecturing and doing all of those things that nobody could quite understand in the family? Yes, exactly. And then... I'm some... not sure I understood it, but I <laughs> pretended. <laughs> <laughs> well, it stood you in good stead for what you're doing now. And then what sort of brought that to a conclusion? Well... Your first career, that is. Yeah, that first career. Well, you may not remember, young fellow like you, mm. but in the 80s there was a Federal Labor Minister for Education, a fellow Dawkins, mm. was actually a pink farmer from Western Australia, I'm not sure what that means. Oh, but well, he probably was... didn't know a lot about cholesterol then. No, 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 okay. no. But he, there was what I refer to as the Dawkins firestorm, swept through the universities, turned the universities inside out, upside down, round about, and then I felt, well, I wasn't contributing, I wasn't doing anything. The changes here in South Australia, I thought, weren't to the good of the... Students, they went to the good of the staff, they went to the good of the university, and so I left. Because they were trying to um, reconcile the cost of unis against what the unis yes. put out? Is that what it was? There was what developed into what I call creeping managerialism, so that the university, somebody said, they're a business. You've got to treat them like a business. So now they're worried about systems and costs and managers and things that... Do not th about people. Do you think... Is there still place, though, for people, even like yourself, to excel within that system? Well, I'm sure there must be. But, well, there are people who excel. I'm not sure there are people like me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you so put yourself I felt... That you shouldn't do that. Yeah, so I felt if I was going to make any sort of contribution it maybe would be outside the university. Now, that's a very important point, because I think in life we all have to come to some sort of reconciliation with what we can do and can't do. Yes, And it's yes. important to understand what that is so we can move forward to the next thing. And you did. You moved forward to your second career. Well, yes, I... Second Hugely career... successful. <laughs> well, when I l resigned from the university, I... the university had been pushing us all to be commercial, to develop our... In... Innovations is the latest word. So I decided to do that. 
So I ran J. Sabine International, and I was a consultant, entrepreneur, but whereas my university career, I believe, had been very successful, as a businessman, I was resoundingly unsuccessful. <laughs> I love your face. Resoundingly unsuccessful. I love it. Yes, yes. I was too busy trying to start too many new businesses uh, all at once. And two things being academic, I knew nothing about business, but also I have a hearing problem. And so you can't really be a consultant if you can't talk to people on the phone. Oh, OK, I get so, that. So, and it uh, took me a long time to realise that. So along came career number three. Career number three. Well, while I'd been at the university particularly, I'd been fortunate enough to be able to travel mm -hmm. and I'd be often invited to international conferences at exotic places and I felt that was marvellous. But it became a problem because after a while I became fairly well known as an after-dinner speaker. So I became worried that my invitations to these conferences were not because of my resounding scientific ability, but because they got a speaker on the cheap. <laughs> but if somebody invites you to some exotic place like Avignon or the Lake District... You'd go, wouldn't you? You'd just go. You'd go. You'd just go, particularly if somebody else is paying for it. Mm. <laughs> you should be in show business. <laughs> Everybody now, when I was is like that. <laughs> doing that, because I was always interested in making my speeches humorous, uh, lots of people said, oh, you should be on the stage, should be on the stage. Oh, I'm no stand-up comedian and I felt no. But 10, 12 years ago, I was sort of introduced to what you would call performance poetry. And I came to realise that if I wanted to do anything like that, then that's where I would go. Well, let's just zoom forward to this year's Fringe here in South Australia. Oh, right. Because you did a show during the Fringe. I did indeed. And I've just recently met you when you were pitching your show... Yes. ..at the South Australian Presenters Association. Right. ..which is a group of South Australian venue managers, of which I'm one, and... Uh, we have a look at, you know, who's got what to offer that we can program in the next year. And yeah, you're huh? going to do something a little later in the year, I know. But I know that you've got something just to give the people watching at home an idea of what it is you're doing. Yeah, well, what I often say is what the Adventure Before Dementia is to try and let people know the joys and the problems of being old, of growing old what you might have missed out on beforehand and now last chance to do what you do. And so I usually do this either in prose or in mostly in poetry. Sometimes I pinch somebody else's stuff. Sometimes I pinch it and modify it. Mm -hmm. But often it's my own creation. OK, so your camera awaits. It's all yours. Well... Do you ever want to run away to the circus? Now, of course, if you go to the circus, you have to have something to do. You have to be able to be something. Oh, how I wish that you could see the clown that lives inside of me. Don't mock me. Laugh with me. Oh, how a clown I want to be, for clowning is the life for me. I don't look too good in tights. I'm dazzled by bright lights. I have no head for heights. No acrobat could I be. But clowning is the life for me. Let the ladies ride the horses round and round the courses, making loops, jumping through hoops, riding bareback, running free. Clowning is the life for me. Oh, to Juggle, I never aspire, I cannot eat fire, I have no magic for hire, all that may be so lovely, but clowning is the life for me. Someone else can flip the whip, train the lions and elephants, get to wear the fancy pants, prance around all fancy free, 
Clowning is the life for me. So I live my life, support the wife, uh, stay out of strife, playing neither drum nor fife. But what you get is not what you see, because there is a clown inside of me. <laughs> Excellent. I love it. I love it. I love it. Did it take you a long time to learn that? Well, uh, I don't know about that. Yes. Somewhere, but, of course, they say if you want to stave off dementia, you need to be actively yeah, getting your mind. Right. So trying to remember something. I know it's a rude thing to usually ask people their age, but we all get to an age where we don't mind bragging about our age. Yeah, no, no, not at all, not at all. So don't tell me right now. We'll be back in a moment. But before we meet Jack, uh, John again, doing old Jack, we're going to meet uh, one of our favourites, Kimberly Douglas, and Jack will return at the end of the program. Back to our time talking about an adventure before dementia. Here's Kimberly Douglas. Hi. Hello. Without dementia. Without dementia. <laughs> I don't have a yet. Because we can continue that conversation mm. because everybody has an adventure before dementia, sort of, don't we? They do, absolutely. Mm. Who are you again? Ah, <sighs> I thought we clarified oh, that. Oh, yeah, we did. Sorry, <laughs> I said that, didn't I? Oh, yeah, I remember that. But it is scary when people, it is. I have a lot of people in my office saying, is it normal to suddenly forget the car keys, to forget my friends' names? You know, I've got this word on the tip of my tongue and I know it's in there somewhere. All They're saying, the have I got dementia? Am I getting Alzheimer's? Mm. Not necessarily. Well, I've got to tell you, I'm like that mm. all the time. I'm desperate, um, really, to remember mm. people's names. Mm. I just wonder, mm. is it possible our brains fill up? That's what it feels like. You know, when you're madly working on a computer, eventually, if you just keep leaving all the stuff in the computer sure. and make it remember everything, it stops remembering. Are we a bit like that? I think stress plays a huge part of it. Okay. I don't think our lives have ever been so busy and people find it very difficult to have time out now. That's very true. So, you know, we fill everything now with technology. We don't even mm. just sit quietly. We've got to be on Facebook or tweeting something or Instagram. Well, I guess even just watching TV, your brain is ticking over following a story or absorbing the information and all the time. One of the biggest things we're finding now is the exposure to these blue screens. So what I'm talking about is any Anything with technology has a blue screen. So what we're finding is people are even cheating themselves of sleep. Mm. So what happens is you go to bed and you're still on the screen in yes. bed or you're quickly swiping through, checking Facebook. Yes. So, you know, one of the biggest things as we get older is we have to make sure we're getting sleep so our body reinvigorates, so it actually cleanses, it gets ready for the next day. So really that's what happens when we're asleep. Although, is mm. it fully understood what happens? what happens to our brain while we sleep? No, I don't think. I don't think we even know half of what no. happens because it's not just about our brain. It's about giving our body a rest, our gut a rest from putting food in. It's giving the liver time for detoxification. So that fasting period while we're sleeping yeah. is really important? Really important. And we're even finding in links with brain and energy and long-term health things like intermittent fasting. So having gaps of up to 15 hours without food. So not getting up straight away in the morning and stuffing food in and racing out the door, what would it look like if you waited till mm. 11 or 12 to have that first meal? And we're seeing research oh, showing that's us interesting. Yeah, yeah, for the way our brain functions, the way we burn fat, the way our metabolism works, the way our liver processes, the way we sleep at night and a range of other things just on looking at the timing of food. So you suddenly mm. think about you're getting stressed, you're getting older, you're cheating yourself of sleep, you may be on way too much technology later at night which blocks that serotonin and melatonin coming in. And often because we're busy we eat the wrong food at the wrong time. Like your chocolate at 10 o'clock at night? Well, I'm not a chocky-holic, I must admit, but I tend to get hungry before I go to bed. Do you? So salt or, or sweet? <laughs> Right, OK. Because they can all mean things to the body too. I don't leave my fingers around because I right. think I'd start sucking them. Right. Well, if you're looking for sweet, so if you're looking for the chocolate and the lollies, right. it's more to do with your blood sugar level. It's more oh, to do with pre-diabetes. Can we do that? And... Can, sure. Can our bodies say, I need 
sugar or can our bodies tell us what foods to eat? Absolutely. So we see the sugary things is usually to do with chromium being low and your blood sugar out of out of balance. Okay. So that's why about the 10.30, the 3.30 in the afternoon, you know that nana nap time we talked about, that 7.30, 8 o'clock at night where you can be watching a TV program, yep. miss a few contestants and come back at 9 o'clock. Yes. So that's all to do with blood sugar. Now if you're looking for salt, so if you're looking for the salted peanuts, you're looking for the chippies, the, to the cheese, that it's more adrenal. Now your adrenal glands are in charge of your energy, your stamina, your stress levels. So okay. often people who are really stressed, what are they looking for? They're looking for the salty things. I even have patients who get up in the middle of the night to go and have cheese or go and eat chips, barbecue shapes are really? a really big thing. Oh, have, I don't have, that. <laughs> have a big feast down on salt, straight back to sleep. Oh really? So straight away we hear about adrenals. Just, as you've been saying that, I've just been thinking it's probably the sweet things that I yearn for before sleep, I think. Mm. Well, all of these, all I the shows we've done, we've always talked about the checkup from the neck up. You know, when you've heard a show or you've heard information, you take it back and go, OK, where's my bad time? Yes, where do I fit in? You know, is it the 3 o'clock in the afternoon that I've got to have the Mars bar just before I pick the kids up and chuck the wrapper out the window so no one knows I'm eating it? <laughs> naughty, or, naughty, uh, naughty, little, know, little, little. I talk to a lot of women's conferences and I often talk about the block of chocolate that we all have stuffed down the back of the cupboard. So because the kids can't the kids Kids can't find it, <laughs> and all the women go, "No, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah no, exactly what you're talking about." So you know, it talks to you. You know, chocolate in the cupboard calls mm. your name, mm. and you know, when you have these kind of symptoms happening, it's all the way of the body saying there's an imbalance, there's a dis-ease in the body, and if you continue to ignore dis-ease, it will lead to disease. Yes, when take I, the hyphen out. Absolutely. You've got a problem. No matter who's sitting in my office and they're saying, I've just been diagnosed with, you know, whether it's a Crohn's, a colitis, a diabetes, a tumour, whatever it is, say, stop. What's been happening the last 10 to 20 years? Interesting. You know, you don't wake up and find the lump and it was cancer appearing that day. No. You don't go to the doctor and find your diabetes. We're very sorry you've got diabetes today. It's what you've been doing for the last 10 or 15 or 20 years of your lifestyle, your sleep, the food you put in, the supplements you put or don't put in, your stress management, your mm. water intake, and a collision of all those things oh, create disease. That's interesting you should say about the water intake because um, that, I find, is, has changed. If I don't drink enough during the daytime, mm. I sleep badly, I, I, everything blocks up inside as well mm. and I'm mm. really uncomfortable. And sometimes when you're really busy, you just forget to drink. Sure, that's right. I think we all do that from time to time. And, you know, to have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, mm. that's a diuretic, really, isn't it? It, it does. It, it dehydrates it... you. Mm. So I have a rule, four glasses by lunch, four glasses by tea. So a standard glass is about 250 ml. And so it's easy to get to 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, and you've only had one glass of water in the morning. Mm. So my rule is get four done by lunchtime. So if you hit lunchtime and you've only had one, you need to scull three to catch yourself up, then you're OK. Yep. But if you wait until the end of the day and you've still only had two or three yes. and you're supposed to have had eight, the way that our body filters and cleanses is not going to work effectively. So you will be up during the night, even if you haven't had enough water, because your liver and kidneys are working harder because they've not got the right fluids. Good. Flush to all flush the, things yeah. through. That's right. Okay, so that's really good advice across the board. Now, speaking of adventures before dementia again, so what about sex life? What happens with people as they get older? Because there are people talking about sex is not something that needs to stop when you're young. It can sure. go on much longer. Absolutely. Is there something that people need to do or do they really have to get the unusual things the doctors can prescribe? Look, you can have the blue pill you know, if that's what you need to do, and that's OK. But it's a bit of a faux pas that people think that your sex life dies off. For a lot of people, because they're no longer stressed, they're no longer doing the corporate life, they're no longer leaving the house and coming home at ridiculous hours, they're actually retired, they have more time. It's actually nothing to be concerned about because for a lot of people, it goes the other way. So just, you know, I guess if there's a dementia issue, 
remembering whether you've had sex or not that day may be an issue. But really, there are some real positives. You don't underestimate the levels of stress that has an impact on libido and hormone levels. So now, you know, we're living longer. We have more things for hormone balancing. So we're not just talking about Viagra and Cialis for men. We also have women using HRT and natural things for HRT, mm -hmm. where normally their progesterone and estrogen and for men, testosterone levels would be going down. There's now lots of natural things. Like there's there's herbs, like there's a herb called horny goat weed of yes. all the stupidest names. I've heard about the horny goat. Whoever called it that beats me. But it actually has <laughs> some really good impacts on uh, blood sugar levels and things like sex drive. Then we have things for women like Vitex and Chase Tree and Dong Kwai that normally where a woman would feel like her sex drive's gone down may have some rebalancing effects. So it isn't all so, over. So when can they find, where can they find the information that would be helpful? Look, with things like what we're talking about regarding sex life, Google, and I know I'm always like, don't Google, but you know, if you're even too scared to talk to your doctor, um, you Good can point. start off with doing some basic research about yep. natural remedies and then talk to someone like me, uh, talk to your doctor. You don't always have to go straight for medication. Um, and they have less and less side effects now. So it certainly is part of your lifestyle. You also have to watch alcohol and you have to watch coffee. It does impair your hormones. And so at whatever age, but the older you get, you don't tend to handle alcohol and coffee. And also there are a lot of side effects of medication. I saw mm. a really interesting stat uh, a couple of months ago that said by age 75, the average Australian is on five prescription medications or more. By age 75. So suddenly when you're on a cholesterol and a blood pressure and a blood thinner and a beta blocker and a, you know, something... And everyone's, uh, everything's it, doing this, isn't it? Just, yes. And people come in and say, I don't feel well and my sex drive's gone. I'm thinking, look at the amount of medication you're on. So you, you do also have to have a discussion with your doctor. I've mm. started this and this seems to have gone down the gurgler. Well, that's very valid. Sure. Kimberly, your advice, as always, is terrific. Can you just Thanks. stay with us a little longer? Sure. Jack is going to come back and join us and we'll find out a little bit more about the adventures before dementia. to our time. We're here with John Sabine and Kimberly Douglas. We've had a very interesting discussion during that commercial break to discover that you both basically worked in the same fields. That's right. Nutrition. Fantastic. And we were talking about cholesterol before. Yes. And that's what he specialised in. Not the go. high, but the low cholesterol. And we talk about that a lot. We is certainly do. Cholesterol is a good thing, not something to talk, be scared of. Talk about wish... like minds. That's right. So, um, John's show is about adventure before dementia, and we've just been talking about all of that. And Phil, our floor manager, loyal Phil, was just saying how he went to the doctor and he had dry eyes, and the doctor said, you're just getting old. And you said... No, it could be anything. It could be anything from allergy. And But then we asked him... Yes. And we discovered... It was gas. And not the wind kind. No. <laughs> no, and that's something interesting because we all sit inside with fires on in the winter time, mm. and you don't sort of realise how drying, like gas heaters or particularly mm. um, air conditioning heaters, sure. can change the way that we even breathe. I uh, start yeah. feeling stuffed up. Well, we see that with gas cooktops. I've even got patients who have problems barbecuing with gas bottles. They have uh, lung issues or wheezing or uh, some sort of allergy reaction, respiratory reaction. So it actually is quite common. So, John, what advice would you give somebody your age, which we never found out before? Uh, that's a two-edged question. Are you asking my advice or my age? Yeah, both. <laughs> both. Well... As, a young, as an 83-year-old youngster, um, I suppose the best regime is what I call the MELF regime. Mm -hmm. Fixes everything. More exercise, less food. Mm, there's an interesting Sounds way great. to look at it. That's good. And if I'd like to actually to write a book about it if I was not well, so now, lazy. No, now's your chance. You've got to do it now. <laughs> You've got to do it in your adventure before <laughs> you know yes, what. Yes, yes, yes. But look, it's almost time for us to go, and we'd like to remind you that you can watch any of our past programs 
on any of these addresses simply by downloading the program. You can download it from the community station that you're watching. You can also catch up with us on YouTube for Our Time TV. And we would love you to uh, keep in touch with us because, as you're probably aware by now, the government was about to pull the community network licences throughout Australia, and we now have a licence until the end of this this calendar year. So we'd love you to keep watching us on free-to-air television, wherever, whichever city you're in at the moment. And until next time, keep yourself nice till we meet again. <laughs>